Today we again hear another one of the, the most famous statements or most popular statements of Jesus. He is asked by a Pharisee, what is the greatest commandment? And he answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. This indeed is the summary of the entire teaching of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And on the surface, it, it seems like a no-brainer. It is so simple and easy to understand. If we love God with our whole heart, mind, and soul, and if we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, we would treat everyone with respect and love, and there would be a perfect peace and happiness. No one would not be taken care of if we truly followed this teaching in its fullness. But we know, sadly, that's not the world that we live in today and that it hasn't been at all and for all the ages. But it should be. And I hope and I pray that it is what we at least strive for in our Christian lives. It's not a political statement or a manifesto of some type. It is the teaching of Christ and God. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I know most of us are sitting here thinking, of course, about what is happening in our country, and no doubt these are serious times for our country and our world, and I'm not, well, I don't consider myself that old, but I've never witnessed a time when I think our nation has seemed so divided, so utterly untrusting of government, so lacking in confidence and so happy, so unhappy with the choices that we have. It's really frightening, and like many of you, I'm very concerned with the direction we may or may not take this November 3rd. But a while back, I had a beautiful experience in some way. I visited Mount Vernon, Virginia, you know, the home of George Washington. And while I was there, I visited his tomb. And I stood there in solemn silence and prayed for a man who was remembered in a eulogy by Richard Henry Lee as first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, a man for the ages. And standing at the tomb of Washington was a strange and sobering experience for me, especially with all that I say has, has been tearing us apart in the nation for the past number of years. I'm a Catholic priest, and Washington was certainly not a Catholic, and he really did not favor Catholicism, and yet I couldn't shake the feeling as I stood there that I was treading on sacred ground. Is it because we have made of him such a large figure of history and, in a way, a myth? Or is it because of the man that he was? Looking over the life of Washington, his thoughts and his many selfless acts, of course, I came to the conclusion that most of us do, that he was truly a man for the ages. He is surely a flawed human being, as many of us are, all of us are in many respects, but he was also a person who rose above those flawed qualities many, many times. He rose above pettiness, above arrogance, above ego, above temptation, self-centeredness, and sinful attitudes. He was a person that expected and demanded much from himself because it enabled him, he thought, to be an example to others and to expect and demand much from others as well. He knew that others would learn nothing if they didn't have good examples in their lives, examples of self-discipline, respect, sacrifice for others, sacrifice for causes greater than himself, love of God, love of country, and in that proper order, God first, country second. Washington looked to his religion and to his religious principles to guide his personal as well as his public life, and he was unafraid, as any of our founding fathers were, to declare his belief that the Creator and the hand of divine providence was the guiding force behind the success of this new nation formed on the belief and the principles and the self-evident truth that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with a certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I know many of you might be thinking this sounds like a political speech in many respects, but it is not. The point that I'm trying to make 
is that as I prayed at that tomb of George Washington, I realized that today we also need a man, or if it happened to be a woman, for the ages. Someone that can lead us through pettiness and bitterness and anger and hatred, hatred for the other. Someone who can lead us past the arrogance and the sinful attitudes and beliefs that many of our, our citizens hold today. At that tomb of Washington, I humbly prayed for this nation. I prayed that somehow we would retrieve the best of what we have been and throw off the worst of what perhaps we have become. I prayed that on this coming election day, God would guide our hands in making the right choice for our nation, for ourselves, that he would guide our elected officials to principles of fostering the common good of all citizens, and that it would turn to uniting us together. In today's gospel, Jesus is tested again. In answer to that question, what is the greatest commandment? He takes those, all the commandments and he reduces them down to a summary of two. Two laws that he wanted all his followers to set like a seal on their hearts. Five words I can make them down to. Love God, love your neighbor. Five simple words. Who is my neighbor though, people ask. Is it only those that think as I do? No. Is it only the wealthy or only the poor? No. Is, it our neighbor, is our neighbor only the Catholic living in our midst? No. Is it only the Trump supporter or the Biden supporter? No. Of course not. If we really listen to the Gospels, and I mean really listen, if we take them into our hearts, we can't help but see that our neighbor is, as it is pointed out in the, that first reading, the alien among us, the widow, the orphan, the impoverished. Our neighbor is, in a way, the Democrat or the Republican that we hate these days. I hate to say it, but I've heard that many, many times. Our neighbor is those who hold a different view of any kind. God doesn't see those distinguished. He sees his children. And for me, that is the saddest result of these past number of years, the division that has been sown and used to drive us apart as a nation. It's also the most dangerous thing to me. I'm tired of it, and I think a lot of us are. Fear, on all sides, has been used to divide us, to make things seem bleaker than I think they really are. I don't believe that if Biden wins, our suburbs are going to be destroyed any more than I believe that the coronavirus is simply going to disappear if Trump wins. I'm not crazy like that. I'm too rational and, I think, intelligent for such fear-mongering and unscientific stuff. We should not do anything. We should not do anything because of our political leanings first. We should be putting God's principles first. God's great two commandments are why we are here. It is why we work at shelters and soup kitchens and outreach. It is why we stock food pantries. It is why some people become foster parents and adoptive parents. It is why we invite those living alone on our block to join us for a meal from time to time, especially around the holidays. Those are examples of love that don't exhaust the myriad ways in which we can live out all the commandments. These and many other ways in which we love our neighbor are concrete proof of what St. Paul says we should be imitators of the Lord, a way of being a model for believers. And so, in a way, I'm asking all my friends and family and all of you as well, that we as a parish, as a nation, that we will put the Christian principles at the forefront of our hearts, minds, and souls when we make perhaps the most important political decision this November 3rd. For me, right now, most important decision in my political life. Jesus tells us in this gospel today to love God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, and our neighbor as ourselves. It is a blueprint for the kingdom of God that he wishes to be established. And it's also a blueprint for our national life and the virtues that we want to live out in this world. 
And as I look around me and as I listen to the candidates on television, not that often because I just can't stand it, <laughs> but as I listen to people of every age, color, and creed argue for or against one side or the other, one philosophy over another, I look for the moral arguments and the ethical arguments, the insertion of the Christian principles. Our first reading warns us what may happen if we treat people wrongly. It lists a, a number of things that can happen to us and eventually says, I will slay you with the sword. It is a frightening summary that none of us want to believe is possible of a loving God. But there it is in black and white for us to read and to apply to ourselves every day. Jesus has given us the blueprint of how we should live our lives. He has given us the greatest commandment, as I say over and over, to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, our mind, and our soul, and to love our neighbor as we would love ourselves. And so, yes, pray to God. Pray to God to help us as a nation to rediscover the best of what we can be and to throw off the worst of what perhaps we have been and what we have become. Pray to God for wise and just and merciful leaders who will be able to look, we will be able to look upon in future generations as people that sacrificed themselves in their service, that were filled with honesty, integrity, wisdom, fear of the Lord, men and women who looked to the common good of a nation, not to feather their own nests or to exalt their own ego. Let us pray for such leaders. We had them at one time. We had a man for the ages. We've had several men of the ages. We haven't had a woman yet, but one day, I think in my lifetime, I hope, I pray we do. And I think women bring a whole different perspective, maybe a better one that we've been missing. But I pray for such leaders, people for the ages that will sacrifice everything of themselves as Christ sacrificed for us.